10 Gruesome Cannibal Movies That Went Unnoticed Hi, my name is Christian Harris. thank you for watching Marvelous Videos. Cannibalism has been a subset of horror movies for many years. Some of the all-time terrifying classics like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Night of the Living Dead portray cannibalism. Heck, the very foundation of zombie films is based on this culinary taboo. From the late 1970s to the early 80s, Western cinema saw an array of cannibal classics, every subsequent entry more gruesome than the last. However, a number of these flicks unfortunately went unnoticed from the larger audience's eyes. This video will bring you 10 such hidden gems that deserve a watch. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. <laughs> Eaten Alive, 1980. Sheila is in search of her missing sister, Diana, in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. Here, she joins forces with Mark, and the duo face several obstacles on their journey. Unbeknownst to them, Diana has been captured by a group of cannibals after escaping an abusive cult. Eaten Alive, directed by Umberto Lenzi, is an Italian horror film that contains the entire gut-wrenching thrill from the 70s and 80s that made for a great cannibal movie. Its special effects consist of the utmost details that will catch viewers' eyes during the gory, blood-soaked scenes. Moreover, for being a low-budget 80s movie, it contains something that most of its like-minded flicks don't a uniquely serious feel. There isn't a comedic undertone that would make the gruesome scenes look hilarious. Instead, it brings a chill down the audience's spine. The film's color schemes are just right, ensuring the cult members look like they belong in their natural habitat. Not to mention, remarkable cast members including Robert Kerman, who didn't even have to audition for his role. However, viewers must keep in mind that this movie is certainly not for the faint-hearted. It contains cynical and sleazy moments of assault, suicide, and slaughter. And though these are fascinating and thrilling, they are for a niche audience. The Cannibals, 1980. Jeremy Taylor and his family are cruising through a jungle on a boat when suddenly a tribe of savages attack them. Though Jeremy manages to escape, his wife is instantly eaten alive, and his daughter Lana is captured by the marauders. Years pass, and Lana continues living with the cannibals, growing up to become their queen. Jesus Franco's The Cannibals was originally known as Mondo Cannibale, or Cannibal World. It is a Spanish-Italian exploitation film filled with cheesiness at its core. Nevertheless, it is intense and has visuals that will shake viewers down to their bones. While it contains all the basic elements of cannibalism that one might expect to see, Franco gives them a unique directorial spin that savors the scenery. Ah! 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 The it contains an out-of-this-world camera work where the cannibals are shown to be preying on their victims in slow motion. Counterbalancing this are a bad English dub and schlocky special effects that will divert viewers' minds from the horrific sight and make them laugh. Overall, with its comedic undertone and intense action, everyone must enjoy this movie on a drunken night with their friends. The Green Inferno, 2013. Justine, a college student from New York, joins a team of activists traveling to Peru to protest a petrochemical company. While the group is on their way back to civilization, their plane explodes and crash lands into a forest. 
There, the survivors are captured by a tribe of cannibals. Eli Roth's The Green Inferno is just as controversial and provocative as his other well-renowned works. It pays homage to the notorious cannibal holocaust, but is not just any mainstream cannibal exploitative movie. If looked closely, it is a thrilling piece of work with a hardcore spirit that has been tempered with sympathy. Roth has created his characters in such a way that viewers can see the clear mockery in some of them. Moreover, he has added multiple layers by bringing out their humanity later in the film when they're faced with perils and forced to undergo character development. The Green Inferno is also filled with intense violence, although slightly toned down compared to the Italian wave in the 70s and 80s that went all out. In the end, Roth comments on certain groups in society by using the cannibal theme to illustrate how their true nature is revealed once they realize they can't fight against the uncivilized and have to turn to their own kind for help. <laughs> the Mountain of the Cannibal God, 1978 Susan Stevens travels to Papua New Guinea with her brother Arthur, where they're searching for her missing husband. Together with Dr. Edward Foster, the siblings venture into the jungle in search of him. Trapped in the claustrophobic natural enclave, they soon discover that each of them has their own agendas for being on the island, and begin having conflicts with one another. Sergio Martino's The Mountain of the Cannibal God is a true cannibal flick from the golden era of horror that displays nastiness in its most vivid form. It was originally an Italian film known as La Montagna del Dio Cannibale, where it was called out by several viewers due to its graphic violence, outlandish sexual scenes, and animal cruelty. Although most cannibal films after the 80s turned out to be rip-offs of Cannibal Holocaust or Cannibal Ferrix, this movie is surprisingly original in its storyline. It boasts an incredible cast starring Stacey Keach and the gorgeous Ursula Andres. Whilst containing gruesomely slick special effects to the point where viewers' stomachs churn at the sight of the extreme bestiality and disgusting creatures crawling around, the heat and claustrophobia of the atmosphere are captured perfectly by the camera techniques used by Martino, accomplished by a pulsating electronic soundtrack in the background. Hannibal, 2001. Following the events of The Silence of the Lambs, Dr. Hannibal Lecter is currently living and working in Italy as a museum curator. While there, Lecter sends FBI agent Clarice Starling a note informing her of his location. When she and her team attempt to apprehend him, Lecter escapes, beginning an adrenaline-pumping chase. Ridley Scott's Hannibal is a pure work of art, created for lovers of the Hannibal franchise rather than the standalone movie itself. It focuses on the brilliance of Lecter's character and the relationship between him and Starling. However, Scott slightly alters the psychological aspect of the Mad Doctor by giving him certain characteristics that are different from what audiences had seen in the predecessor. Certain viewers felt like Julianne Moore couldn't quite capture the charisma and subtlety with which Jodie Foster did. Nevertheless, the movie brings even more depth to Starling. The film's visual style and performances are superb, and though it doesn't contain the same amount of gore and blood that viewers will see in an Italian exploitation, it still makes for a thrilling perspective on cannibal horror films. Cannibal Apocalypse, 
1980. In a flashback to the Vietnam War, Norman Hooper gets bitten by a prisoner of war named Charlie Bukowski, who is infected by a deadly virus that leads people to crave human flesh. Several years later, Hooper is living in Atlanta. Following a nightmare, Hooper wakes up to hear that Bukowski has gone crazy, having shot up people in a department store. While accompanying the man to the hospital, a series of chaotic events ensue. Antonio Margheriti's Cannibal Apocalypse is an intriguing film from Italy's golden age of exploitation films. Besides its sheer entertainment value and lunacy, it also contains a variety of elements that have been derived from several prior horror flicks, tastefully blending themes, images, and ideas into one classic that makes for an exciting watch. It contains extreme action, portraying a chase through Atlanta's streets as the virus-infected war veterans are being pursued by Captain McCoy, the profane, comical police officer. I'll tell you what else I'm gonna do. Viewers might find similarities between Margariti's work and Romero's Dawn of the Dead. However, his film displays the heroes playing the cannibals. Margariti cleverly uses the virus and its after-effects as a metaphor for the psychological trauma that veterans face during and after combat. Even without the virus, the three soldiers were never the same when the Vietnam War ended. Oh well. Then. The Ravenous, 1999. Following a cowardly performance during the battle in the Mexican War, Captain John Bodie is forced to relocate to Fort Spencer. Here, he is third in command after two Native American siblings, George and Martha. Soon, a Scottish stranger called Calhoun appears, recovering from frostbite. He narrates a story to everybody about how the leader of his party began eating the party members for survival. Being bound by duty, the soldiers must visit the cave where this occurred to check for survivors. Before leaving, George warns those who stay behind that Calhoun might be a Wendigo, an evil Algonquin spirit that urges its victims to crave human flesh. Ravenous, directed by Antonia Bird, is a dark, atmospheric film putting a different edge to the concept of cannibalism. It establishes a cold, sinister tone, much before the true essence of the story is revealed to viewers, whilst also containing remarkable cinematography as the characters enter the cave and find themselves in another deeper grotto. Bird makes sure that there are surprises throughout the film that keep audiences on their feet. Moreover, she prioritizes the film's atmosphere over the progression of the plot, providing a more thrilling and anticipating impact on viewers. The color schemes used truly put viewers in the cold, damp world, carrying the misery along with them. Shot in Slovakia, Ravenous also captures some of the most beautiful sceneries complementing the ominous vibe. Cannibal Holocaust, 1980. A small American film crew in 1979 ventures into the unexplored parts of the Amazon rainforest. This crew wants to make a documentary based on the indigenous cannibal tribes in the area. However, they vanish without a trace. Soon after, renowned anthropologist Harold Monroe and his team set out on a rescue mission to retrieve the missing crew. During their journey, they catch the eyes of the local tribes that no one has ever lived to tell the story of. Professor Monroe eventually discovers video evidence from the documentarians and brings it back home, only to be shocked at the raw, unedited footage. Ruggiero Deodato's Cannibal Holocaust certainly lives up to its name. The film was shot in an authentic location on the borders of Brazil and Colombia, using real indigenous people living in the area as the cannibals. 
Moreover, the violence and action of the film's climax were inspired by the media coverage of the Red Brigade's terrorism in Italy. This was a leftist organization in Italy that caused several violent uprisings. Unfortunately, the content of this movie created such controversy that even Deodato was arrested due to the obscene incidents that it showcased. Nevertheless, viewers who grew up watching horror movies in the 70s and 80s will be much accustomed to the depictions of violence amongst differing races and cultures. Cannibal Holocaust is also one of the pioneers of the found footage genre, coming out long before renowned movies like The Blair Witch Project and The Visit existed. Besides being extremely gory, Deodato emphasizes remarkable cinematography and editing styles for the climax. The savage cruelty that viewers see is contrasted by the beautiful scenery of the jungle and the terrific score by Ritz Ortolani. Anthropophagus, 1980. A group of tourists travel to a remote island by boat, only to find that most of its inhabitants have disappeared. Moreover, they also realize that they are being stalked by someone. After exploring further, they find a big mansion on a hill in the island, and within that mansion is a hidden room. In this room, they discover an ancient diary, in which they find clues about the horrors that lurk in the shadows, and the answers to who might be following them. Joe D'Amato's Anthropophagus, also known as The Savage Island or The Grim Reaper, was one of the most controversial movies created in the early 1980s. It is a schlocky, grotty piece of work, with enough gore to make viewers sick to their stomach. Nevertheless, it is extremely entertaining, along with being very scary. It contains enjoyable graphic details, so much so that it was appointed as a high-priority video nasty during the time of its release. Anthropophagus also contains a frightening atmosphere and one of cinema's most horrifying movie monsters that will give viewers nightmares for days. Overall, if people can stomach this campy low-budget B-flick, it's one of the most realistic renditions of cannibalism that will bring chills down their spines. Cannibal Ferrix, 1981. A group of anthropologists venture into the Colombian jungles to study the cannibals that are native to the area. Instead of cannibals, they encounter a bunch of drug dealers who are using the natives to harvest coca leaves. However, the natives soon get tired of taking orders and being treated like slaves. They decide to take revenge on the drug dealers as well as the anthropologists. Cannibal Ferrix, directed by Umberto Lenzi, belongs right in the middle of the cheap Italian exploitation production era. The main recurring theme that most of these films, including this one, seem to present is uncivilized native cannibals being pitted against civilized people. Lenzi's movie was one of the foremost films that actively tackled the topic of savagery and cannibalism in the form of a myth or a restrained reality. Cannibal Ferrix is a film that portrays competing plot lines within the same narrative. On the one hand, there's the story that showcases cannibalism as a colonialist myth used as a bedtime story. And on the other hand, there is the reality about the existence of cannibals. Like many other cannibal films, Cannibal Ferrix also involves the real-life slaughtering of animals and mutilation. It contains its own sense of moral orientation that make viewers contemplate on who the true savages are in society. Lenzi researched the theory of viewers being entertained by the sight of animals fighting animals and humans fighting humans. Through this film, he brings to the surface the concept of people being blissfully ignorant of certain things, rather than having knowledge about their harsh reality. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone. Justine! I made it.
appreciate it. <laughs>